welcome along this afternoon to uh, one of the first webinars in um, the continuing education series that we're doing with IDEX. Um, just um, uh, some sort of shorter webinars on different bits and pieces um, to just try and give uh, give people a little bit more information about um, you know some of the areas that we're working in. Uh, the one today, we're going to talk about the minimum database. Just to let you know, we're splitting this into two parts. So today we're going to cover um, the CBC and the biochemistry with it. Um, next week there's a second webinar um, and we're going to cover some other aspects of the minimum database with that. But our plan is sort of to, to discuss, you know, what's in that minimum database, when it's useful to be using it, and then also a discussion of the individual components um, of, of the minimum database. <clears throat> I always like to put a case in here, it just sort of brings things to life a little bit more. So this is Lani, a seven and a half year old female spade Doberman. Well, the registration form said Doberman, I'm not sure that her parents even knew a Doberman, but um, she was a nice dog and she was presented with a history of vomiting. Her relevant history was um, she'd had quite a few years of having um, spinal pain and hip pain that had been managed with um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. What her owners tended to do with them was um, give them to her when she needed them. Um, at times where she wasn't sore, they would reduce the frequency of it so that she was getting less of it. Um, but her more immediate history was that she'd had um, some intermittent vomiting over the previous five days and she'd also been somewhat inappetent, um, which was very unusual for Lani. Uh, initially, the vomit contained food with some bile staining, um, but the last day before, um, before presentation, the vomit had become dark and tarry. So obviously that concern that there was some digested blood in there. Um, she was an inside-outside dog, but when she was um, outside, she was in an enclosed yard. If she went for walks, she was on a leash. So, and um, the neighbours loved her. The owners said no one would ever do anything to her. So there was no known toxin access. Her diet was based on a good quality commercial dry food. Um, and she also got some table scraps, but table scraps, things like, um, you know, rice or veggies or stuff like that. She wasn't getting anything too exotic. On her physical examination, um, her temperature, heart rate were both, um, you know, as to be expected, they were pretty unremarkable. She was panting, but there was no um, dyspnea or anything, no, no effort. Um, her mucous membranes were sort of orange, that uh, mixture of pink and yellow there. Her refill was good, um, despite the fact she hadn't been eating for a few days, she was still um, in very good body condition. Um, and when you looked at her, her sclera were ictric, her skin was ictric. Um, so there was, there was no doubt um, about the ictris. So I guess for me, when I'm thinking of a problem list, to me, what I want to put on there are the things that if I find the cause of that, I'm most likely to find out what's wrong with the dog. So whilst there are a few things on her problem list, the two that were most, I thought were most relevant were the vomiting and the icterus. You know, the vomiting suggests that we've got gastrointestinal disease that can be primary. So, you know, something infectious, inflammatory bowel disease, um, something neoplastic, or what I would refer to as the grabble group of an intestinal accident, so dietary indiscretion, a foreign body, and interception, stuff like that. Um, or it could be secondary, so metabolic causes, you know, non GI inflammatory or neoplastic disease, even potentially central nervous system disease with that. Um, the ictrus, you know, we think is it pre hepatic, hepatic, or post hepatic? was pretty comfortable in Lani even before we'd done any workup on her to say it was really unlikely to be prehepatic because she was still nice and pink. So it's really unlikely a dog's going to have a prehepatic um, icterus if they're not pale with that. Um, so uh, we'll come back to her. We'll, we'll think about some diagnostic plans and therapeutic plans later on. So I guess the question is when we're talking about the minimum database, you know, the question always arises, you know, is it necessary? Is it appropriate? 
is it going to be helpful for us? And, and our focus today is going to be on patients that are unwell. So I think when you have a patient that is unwell, you do your history and physical exam and there's no obvious cause with that, it's going to provide us valuable information. Even at times where we don't get a definite answer, it's going to be helpful to, for us to rule things out with that. When I talk about the value of today and the future, I guess that's maybe stepping back from um, doing sickness testing, but if we have some baseline values in health on a patient, um, they're not only giving you value the time that you do that testing, but they're giving us value in the future by letting us know where that patient normally runs out with, you know, things like the red cell mass with a lot of biochemical parameters. So, you know, previous results can give us um, help down the track. Whilst we're talking about the minimum database today with diagnostic testing, one thing I really want to emphasise is we're not talking about using a minimum database as an alternative to doing a, getting a good history and doing a thorough physical examination. It's additional testing. So still our focus has always got to be initially that really thorough history and physical examination as a starting point and then the diagnostic testing beyond that can give us important information. I guess one thing to emphasise here is, you know, looking at doing a minimum database is not, this is not just coming um, from somebody in a diagnostic company saying, oh, do more testing. Uh, you know, there are a lot of um, sort of peak bodies like, you know, the Association of Feline Practitioners, the American Animal Hospital Association, that you know, talk about doing minimum database um, even in health periods of time to try and give us an additional layer of information about the health of patients. Even here locally, um, this is now a few years old, but the um, uh, AVA and uh, what were ASAVA now, ASAV, um, you know, produced these guidelines um, a few years ago where they looked at um, you know, the sorts of testing you would do at different life stages and things like that. Again, probably focused on healthy patients, but still have relevance in animals that are unwell. I guess one of the things that is happening sometimes is, you know, sometimes people are reluctant to perform the minimum database. Um, you know, sometimes there's the concern of, well, are we doing too much diagnostic testing? There can sometimes be the concern of, you know, the cost of doing that. And so there are times where, you know, people, people won't do it. And I think, you know, you sometimes get caught out with that cost factor. I know there are certain certainly times in my past as a veterinarian where I didn't necessarily offer what I thought was an ideal um, testing regime because I was worried about the cost and that the clients may not be able to afford it. Um, I guess one thing I learned over the years is um, when a client told me one day when I'd done the diagnostic testing bit by bit, he said to me, well, why didn't you offer me all of this up front? And I was like, well, I was worried it was going to cost a lot. And very nicely, they said to me, well, that's my choice, not yours. You know, let me know what you think's ideal and I'll decide if I can afford that or not. So sometimes things like that stick with you. I think one thing we've got to consider is, you know, um, when we're getting diagnostic test results, you know, with clinical pathology, we're comparing those results to the reference interval that comes out of our in-house analyzer that comes back from the reference laboratory. And we put a lot of faith in these reference intervals and they are useful for us. There is no doubt about it, but there are some times where they can have some limitations. You know, if we think about how a reference interval is created, you know, ideally, well, we should have a reference population. So if you've got an analyzer that's been developed or you know, in-house or at a reference laboratory, um, you know, ideally you would have that reference population, which should be at least 120 patients in there that should be healthy based on their history and physical examination. Then you collect blood from that population and they should be variable ages, variable breeds, variable sizes, and hopefully a relatively even um, distribution of sexes um, in that population.
So you collect blood from them. Um, you know, let's say we're, you've got a new chemistry analyzer, you know, a newly developed chemistry analyzer, you would um, collect serum, say for testing with that. It should be same size needle, same size syringe, same volume of blood collected with the same volume of blood into the same type of tube that's processed and stored the same way. And then when you have all those samples at the end, then you would run them twice with the same operator on the analyzer that you're testing. And then we get that reference interval. So if it's a normal distribution, you take the central 95%. So cut off the bottom two and a half percent, cut off the top two and a half percent, and that's what your reference interval becomes. So does that mean if we have a result within the reference interval, are we guaranteed it's normal? And the answer is not always. There are times that we know we can get a normal result where it shouldn't be normal. So for example, a patient with hypoadrenal cortisism, we might get a normal leukogram, but if that's a sick patient, they should have a stress leukogram. So sometimes normal is not always normal. Um, if something's outside the reference interval, does that automatically make it abnormal? And the answer with that is not always. You know, sometimes if it's mildly outside the reference interval, that patient may be sort of the equivalent of the 5% of the population who got excluded from that reference interval. So uh, you know, we've got to be careful with that. If something's more markedly outside the reference interval, then it likely, more likely is abnormal. But you know, when we think about how the tests are created, if you do 20 tests, you've got a reasonable chance that you might find something outside the reference interval and we've got to determine, is that relevant for that particular patient or not? And you know, one of the challenges is we can have some um, overlap between health and disease. So for example, if we talk about a, two cats that we've done creatinines on, and both of those cats have a creatinine of 200. Uh, if, one of, if the first cat we look at, it's happy, it's healthy, not showing any clinical signs. We look back at its medical record and its creatinine's always been around about 200. I would say that cat's probably fine and it's concentrating its urine and things like that. Cat number two, maybe that isn't feeling quite as well, uh, you know, has some clinical signs. Uh, we, its urine's not as concentrated. We look at its history and its creatinine before has been around 150 or 160 and now it's 200. Um, I'm concerned that that cat has um, kidney disease with that. So I'm going to interpret that differently for that second cat. So we always need to look at the results in light of the patient. One thing we have when we look at the, um, uh, the, the spectrum of patients we have, especially if we look at our canine population, we have an incredibly variable population of patients. And they recognise in human medicine this concept of biologic variation. Um, so um, where there can be variation in results between different groups in the population. So you may apply slightly different reference intervals to that. And you know, biologic variation can be um, you know, what we would call pre-analytical. So, you know, different quality of sample that we're collecting. So for example, you might collect a sample from a cat at two different times. One time the cat's really cooperative. We get a nice free flowing blood sample. The next time we do it, the cat's not being so cooperative and we get this hemolyzed sample. Well, we would expect different results. There can be variation, analytical variation, and also variation within and between an individual. There are very fancy ways, which are a little bit above my head, of, of looking at um, uh, determining whether results are better evaluated by looking at a population-based reference interval, whether we get an extra layer of information by comparing to an individual-based reference interval. So that's looking at compared to previous results. Um, there was a study done a few years ago out of Oregon State University in North America, done actually by an Australian, Craig Royal. Um, and they looked at a group of dogs that they um, collected a series of samples over three months with them. All the dogs were healthy. They processed all the samples at the same time using some very fancy calculations, um, using something called the index of individuality. They were able to determine what was best looked at by population-based reference interval and what was best looked at individually. You can see there, glucose, triglycerides, phosphate were pretty reasonable to look at with the population-based reference interval. 
all the other analytes in what would be considered a reasonably standard biochemical profile were better evaluated by, well, you get an extra layer of information by looking at them compared to previous results in health. So for example, you know, if the creatinine's always been around 140, you know, let's say it's a dog and its creatinine's been around 100. If it then goes up to 130, it's still within the reference interval, but that should be a clue that something is changing with that patient's kidney function. I guess one way for us to try and use these previous results is looking at things, if, if you look at your results in VetConnect Plus, you get that history of results right there in front of you. And if you're not using that, it's a little bit more difficult to achieve that. If you're trying to trawl back through a medical record and having to pull paper out of a file or, or look at each individual visit to get the results. So by being able to see all these results together and look at the trending, um, we can get that extra layer of information um, about that patient. So for setting up that sort of individual reference interval, you know, I guess the question is where do we begin and how many tests do we need? If you can get a couple of sets of results um, in between the ages of say one and six, um, and it's not necessarily getting them into say, oh, we need to collect blood to you know, set up an individual reference interval, but it may be doing a pre-anesthetic screen on a patient that's coming in for just a prophylactic dental that patient as well, um, or you know, maybe getting blood every now and then just for wellness testing. So that, that can set us up well for the future. But moving on to, you know, specifically onto the minimum database, <clears throat> excuse me, we're really looking at four main components of that. So we look at the CBC, and that needs to be a complete blood count. So this should be a CBC that has a five-part differential, that has the, you know, the red cell mass, so hematocrit, hemoglobin, um, and red cell count, has the red cell indices, um, and has a reticulocyte count with that, because we need that reticulocyte count to help us interpret the results. And as I said, a five-part differential and the platelet parameters. When we're looking at the chemistry profile, especially if we're talking about a sick patient, that should be a full chemistry, <clears throat> excuse me, that also includes SDMA, electrolytes, so that we're getting the full picture of that patient. To really interpret the chemistry profile properly, we really do need the urinalysis as well. And when we're talking about the urinalysis, which we'll talk in more detail about next week, um, we're looking at a complete urinalysis. So that means looking at the physical properties of the urine, so the colour, the clarity, the concentrating ability, looking at the chemical analysis of the urine, which is the dipstick, but also looking at a sediment exam and doing that sediment exam as soon as possible after the collection of the urine. So they're the three components that we should be doing each time we run the minimum database, um, you know, in a healthy patient for wellness, or as we're talking about today, in sick patients with that. The disease specific testing are things that we're not necessarily going to do on every patient. We're going to do those based on the patient's signalment and presenting compliance. So for example, you know, if it's a cat over seven or eight years of age with appropriate clinical signs, we're going to include a T4 in that. You know, if it's a patient with gastrointestinal disease, diarrhea, we should include fecal parasitology, um, maybe a PCR, but you know, we decide that case by case based on, um, you know, because they've got diarrhea. Um, you know, it may be, in a patient with urinary tract science doing a urine culture or a patient that's got proteinuria doing a UPC ratio. So these are tests um, that we're only going to do as indicated. They're not necessarily going to be a routine part of that minimum database in every patient. So the question comes of when do we do the minimum database? You know, it certainly becomes easier in patients that are unwell. You know, if they're sick, we can't find an obvious cause for their clinical signs on the history and physical examination. Um, very easy to, to justify doing the minimum database. Um, we may also do it in those patients. You know, I'm sure you all see them at times where someone brings their dog or cat in and they say, look, they're just not well. 
this, you know, they're just not right. And you, but there's nothing else specific on the history and on your physical exam, there's nothing remarkable. You know, most of the time if the client is worried that there's something going on, um, there may well be something happening. So doing the minimum database in that setting um, may give us a clue as to what's going on or might give the owner some comfort that, well, look, all these tests that we've done are normal, you know, and we may be more comfortable about monitoring a patient in that setting. There are certainly times where we know what's wrong with the patient, but we may still do the minimum database. So for example, that, you know, young, let's say a Labrador puppy that comes in, it's got a history of always eating things. Um, you know, the people notice a sock missing, the puppy's not eating and vomiting. You do your history and physical exam and you can feel something in its gut and it feels like you've got distended loops of gut there. You might take a radiograph and you're pretty comfortable that this dog's got an intestinal obstruction. But we still might do the minimum database in that setting to look for the effect of that um, process on them metabolically. Do they have any signs of inflammation with the high white cell count? Are the signs of dehydration? Let's make sure their platelets are okay because we're probably going to do surgery on them with the CBC. Looking at the chemistry profile to see, is there a pre-renal azotemia? Are their electrolytes messed up with that? So we're looking for the effects of the um, with that. So when we're looking, if we start with the CBC, um, you know, there's a lot of information in there. But I guess one way, and it sometimes can seem a little overwhelming, especially if there are a lot of changes, but there are some ways that we can approach it to try and simplify looking at it. Now, if we look at the red cell parameters first, the red blood cell count, hematocrit and hemoglobin are three different ways of telling us the same thing. They're looking at the red cell mass. You know, as a rough rule of thumb, if you, and they should both all behave the same way. So as a rough rule of thumb, if you multiply the hemoglobin by three, you should roughly get what the hematocrit is. So it can be a little sort of quality control thing when you're looking at the results. But as I say, they're all telling us the same thing. I'm sure you all learned about those red cell indices back in vet school when you were sort of, you know, doing clinical pathology and, you know, MCV's mean cell volume, MCHC's mean cell hemoglobin concentration and RDW's red cell distribution width. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you probably remember learning that, um, uh, you know, uh, that the indices might give us a clue about certain disease settings. So, you know, a macrocytic hypochromic anemia, so MCV high, MCHC um, uh, lower, is consistent with a regenerative anemia um, because the reticulocytes are bigger cells and they've got less hemoglobin in them. So the hemoglobin concentration drops. Um, the red cell distribution with, or if it's normocytic normochromic, theoretically it should be a non-regenerative anemia. Um, if, if it's microcytic hypochromic, we start to worry about things like iron deficiency. Important to realise that whilst they're useful for us to look at, they do have their limitations with that. So if we're trying to look for regeneration, really important to look at the reticulocyte count. You know, th there are three main ways we can determine regeneration. One is to look at a blood film. If we have anisocytosis, so variable red cell size, and polychromasia, so variable staining. That, if we've got enough of it, it's suggestive of a regenerative response. So because the reticulocytes are bigger and will stain slightly differently, even on just the routine diff quick staining. You know, the second way that we can try and determine is what we talked about before, is the anemia macrocytic and hypochromic. Some studies done a few years ago looking at cats and dogs with that, and they found the sensitivity of that was really poor less than 20% in cats um, and around about 11 or 12% in dogs. So if we're relying on that alone, we're going to miss some regenerative anemias. If you see macrocytosis and hyperchromasia, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be a regenerative anemia, but not seeing it doesn't rule out that possibility. So our most objective way is to look at a reticulocyte count. I don't tend to look at the percentage count because you need to correct that for the degree of anemia. So for example, a 3% reticulocyte count on a hematocrit of 30 is different to a 3% reticulocyte count on a hematocrit of 10. On the hematocrit of 10, there's only a third the number of reticulocytes there. Whereas that absolute reticulocyte count 
is looking at the number of um, reticulocytes per unit volume of blood. So we don't need to correct that for the hematocrit. So if it's above the reference interval, it's a regenerative anemia with that. It's also important to consider reticulocytes. You sometimes, um, you know, through certain labs or on certain in-house machines, um, specifically the IDEX ones, you get a reticulocyte count on every dog or cat, whether they're anemic or not. And I'm sure you guys probably sometimes see patients that have normal hematocrit or red cell mass, but there are reticulocytes present. There are a couple of, maybe three main potential explanations for that. The reticulocytes tend to hang out in their spleen while they're maturing. So if you have a patient that gets stressed, spleen contracts, those reticulocytes go into circulation. So we may see a high reticulocyte count. They will find their way back to the spleen later on. Um, it can sometimes be the result of underlying hemorrhage or hemolysis. So a patient that has those underlying diseases, but has not yet become anemic with it. Um, but sometimes looking at their previous um, hematocrit, if it's dropped from before, that might be a clue, or things on history and physical exam. The other explanation may be if your red cell mass is high, um, that it could be a patient developing um, erythrocytosis because of heart or lung disease or an erythropoietin producing tumour or, or certain bone marrow problems. The other one, and I don't have it on the list here, is now we've got reticulocyte hemoglobin on the, on the um, uh, pro site or in the reference laboratory. It gives us an indication of iron availability for erythropoiesis. And as opposed to serum iron, which doesn't help as much, and looking for microcytosis and hyperchromasia, which takes some time to develop because the MCV and MCHC are average values and the red blood cell lifespan is quite long. The reticulocyte hemoglobin is looking at cells produced in the last couple of days that are only in circulation for a couple of days. So it's giving us a much more acute idea. Um, reasons it could be low are true iron deficiency but probably more common, reduced iron availability. So with inflammation, uh, a substance called hepcidin gets produced that traps iron in the cells that store it. So there's iron there, but you can't use it for red cell production. Um, portosystemic shunts, some young animals, and some of the breeds of dogs um, or cats that are naturally microcytic, so like Japanese Akitas or Shiba Inus, may also have a low reticulocyte hemoglobin. When we're looking at the white cells, um, I don't tend to look at the percentages. I'll look at the total white cell count and then I look at the absolute values because it's difficult to try and determine what's normal from the percentage. If we say, oh, 75% reticulocytes is normal, well, 75% retics on a white cell count of 10 is different to 75% retics on a white cell count of two or a white cell count of 50. So I look at the absolute values. And what we're really looking at with the white cells is patterns of change to try and help us with that. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and the platelets, remember the platelet count is the thing that's most likely going to be affected um, by artifact. They want a clump. Um, so if it's low, we always need to consider that possibility. And then we've got the indices. So the MPVs, mean platelet volume, immature platelets tend to be a little larger, also larger in some brains like Cavalier King Charles Spaniels that have the congenital macrothrombocytopenia, the PDW is the platelet distribution width, and the PCT is the platelet crit. So what is the total mass of platelets? The machines give us numbers, but it's also important that we're looking you know, in patients that are unwell, patients that have abnormal results, or patients with results flagged. Um, we need to be looking at a film. So some of the things we talk about, you know, we look at here, you can see with the anisotosis and polychromasia, those slightly bigger blue staining cells are the reticulocytes. Um, the hyperchromasia down the bottom left there is where we have cells that have less iron, so they stain much less intensely. And we can see another example of the polychromasia there. So, and if we've got, you know, looking for abnormal white cells, looking for platelet clumps and things like that, you know, we can't replace looking at the blood film. As I said before, when we're looking at white cells, we're looking at patterns. So, you know, if we've got, um, you know, the we can get the sort of excitement leukograms. We don't see it as often, but that's the effect of adrenaline. So neutrophils may go up a little, lymphocytes may go up a little. So that's the patient that got anxious in the waiting room. 
a stress locogram is not something they get because they got anxious in the waiting room or they didn't like the car ride in. It takes at least four to six hours for a stress locogram to develop. And usually it's a reflector either of you know, glucocorticoids or excess cortisol or an underlying illness that's causing metabolic stress in that patient. So lymphopenia, eosinopenia, and a, usually a mild neutrophilia are the hallmarks of that. An inflammatory leukogram, it's important to remember that not every inflammatory leukogram has a high white cell count or a high neutrophil count. You can have a significant inflammatory leukogram with a normal white cell count because that white cell count is a balance of production and consumption. So if those white cells are being used up as quickly as they're being produced, the white cell count may stay normal. So if we get banned neutrophils, which you'll get an idea of from the lab or the prosite will flag those, it doesn't matter what the white cell count is. If you've got banned neutrophils there, it tells you there's an inflammatory response. And also remember that we can have a stress leukogram and an inflammatory leukogram together. They're not mutually exclusive. That inflammatory process may be causing stress. So if we look here, um, you know, looking at the blood film. So this is a normal segmented neutrophil. The mature neutrophils have narrow parts of their nucleus. Banned neutrophils don't. So if we see bands, we know there's inflammation. If we look on this next picture here, um, we get almost that more um, kidney-shaped looking nucleus. That's a metamyelocyte, which means that we've got really significant inflammation. That's the stage before a band. If we have things like this, which is a myelocyte, that's really dramatic inflammatory demand because that's the stage before a metamyelocyte. If we see toxic changes, so that tends to be shown by um, cytoplasmic basophilia, so the cytoplasm on the cells, the neutrophil starts to look a little bluer. Um, we may get cytoplasmic vacuolation where we get some white holes punched in the cytoplasm or dolly bodies, which are these blue spots in there. If we're seeing toxic change, it's an altered maturation of the cells and it is also a reflection of inflammatory demand. When we look at the platelets, as I said before, they're the ones that are most affected by clumping. So, you know, this is where a blood film is important. So seeing platelets clump like this can tell us that the platelet count is going to be higher than what the machine is telling us. And if you're looking on the oil objective on 100 times, we'd hopefully be seeing at least 10 platelets per high power field in the monolayer. Um, if we're starting to see large platelets there, um, like we're seeing, um, you know, down, or where's the pointer? Down here, um, that's telling us we've got immature platelets in circulation or potentially something going on like a Cavalier King Charles that's got the congenital issue where their platelets don't divide normally. So a low platelet count, but normal platelet, um, a bigger platelet size. So the total platelet mass is normal. It's just with less platelets and they don't have signs of bleeding. When we look at the biochemical profile, um, you know, with with this, we sort of, you know, we group things together to, to look at. So we look at the electrolytes. You know, most of the time if we're looking at sort of low sodium and chloride, that can be lost through the GI tract, lost through the urinary tract, um, things like Addison's disease or altered fluid balance. High sodium and chloride um, can reflect things like dehydration or excess aldosterone. Um, chloride can change with things like acid base balance as well. Potassium is important to look at. You know, it can drop with things like inappetence, lost through the gut, lost through the urinary tract, um, or transcellular shifts, um, or with excess aldosterone. Um, whereas high potassium can occur with things like gastrointestinal disease, things like whipworms, um, acute kidney injury, urinary retention like a ruptured bladder or a blocked cat, um, or, or things like Addison's disease. Um, so. Or, or things like tissue necrosis as well. Remember, hemolysis can affect the samples as well. You know, bicarbonate, we're getting a sense of acid-base balance with that. Bicarbonate's low, we worry about a metabolic acidosis. Bicarbonate's high, we worry about things like a metabolic alkalosis, which we sometimes see with particular gastrointestinal diseases, especially if they're vomiting and just losing um, gastric fluid. And in those dogs or cats, often a very low chloride, high bicarb, um, and a low potassium as well. When we look at things like glucose, you know, obviously we know high glucose can be things like diabetes, um, but potentially also stress in cats. And cats can be difficult with that um, because sometimes um, it can be 
difficult to know if it's if it's stress um, or, or diabetes. So looking at things like urine, potentially testing like fructosamine may may give you more information with that. If we think of things like a low blood glucose, so and patients with clinical signs of you know weakness, collapse, tremors, seizures, and things like that, where their glucose is low. That can be things, you know, it can be the result of neoplasia, things like an insulinoma, but also non-pancreatic neoplasia. Some liver tumours or smooth muscle tumours can do that. Uh, can be the result of liver failure because the liver produces glucose in between meals. Um, Addison's disease can sometimes do it as well. Um, and sepsis or some young animals really with really poor body stores. When we look at the kidneys, you know, um, I heard... Um, a specialist from SASH the other week giving a webinar and Joe was saying, wasn't life simpler when we just, you know, when you diagnose kidney disease with, you know, azotemia and poor urine concentrating ability, the sensitivity was a little lower when we we're just doing that. But if you had those combination of signs, um, generally it meant they had kidney disease. We've always got to interpret urea and creatinine knowing that they've got um, some challenges. The, you know, if we've got a patient that's azotemic, we've always got to think, is it pre-renal, is it renal, or is it post-renal? And for post-renal, things like clinical exam are going to give us a lot of information. For pre-renal, we're going to be looking at things like urine concentrating ability. Remember, urea can go up because of renal or pre-renal disease, can go up with gastrointestinal hemorrhage, can go up with a high-protein diet. It might drop with a low protein diet or liver failure because the liver's making urea. So if the liver's not working properly, it can drop. Um, creatinine, <clears throat> still a really useful marker for us, but we've got to keep in mind that it's affected by lean body mass because it's a breakdown product of muscle and muscle's turning over all the time. So in a patient with um, a really high muscle mass, so like a greyhound or an American staffy, um, their creatinine may be above the reference interval, um, and that's normal for them. Whereas animals that have lost a lot of weight, so that old sick renal failure cat, um, that dog with um, a hyperadrenocorticism that's lost a ton of muscle, their creatinine can drop quite a bit. So sometimes in in a cat that's in really lean condition, a creatinine that's like high end of reference interval is suspicious that if you put some muscle mass on them, that it would actually be higher. Um, the Also keep in mind that, you know, these are very general rules, but, you know, generally we don't get azotemic till you've lost about three quarters of your kidney function. SDMA is a new marker that we've got, or well, relatively new these days. Um, keep in mind, we're not going to interpret in isolation. Um, three main differences to creatinine. It tends to be more tightly adhered to GFR than creatinine is. Keep in mind that early on, as renal function drops, you can get fairly big changes in GFR with relatively small changes in creatinine. As renal disease gets more severe, um, small changes in the GFR will cause big changes in creatinine. Whereas STMA is a little more tightly adhered to it, so it can be a little more objective. It goes up sooner than creatinine does. So usually with around 40% loss of kidney function, um, and it's not um, affected by lean body mass the way uh, creatinine is. But we've always got to say that if we have, especially you know, a patient that's not azotemic, that's got a mildly increased STMA, we're not going to make big decisions about their renal function based on a single sample. We should always check urine, do a physical exam. Are there any other signs of kidney disease there? If there aren't, ideally what we should do is repeat that STMA in a few weeks, plus the creatinine, plus looking at the urine. If it's persistently elevated, then we need to be concerned that maybe they've got stage one kidney disease and, and consider some more work up with that. Um, you know, calcium, we've got to remember that with calcium, it can be affected by other things in the blood. So albumin um, and hydration and hemolysis and things like that. But low calcium can be the result of GI disease, you know, renal loss, um, hypoparathyroidism, or sometimes pancreatitis, or things like eclampsia. My calcium can be the result of malignancy, um, hyperparathyroidism, kidney disease, Addison's, certain infections, vitamin D, toxicity, things like that. Um, but we're going to interpret that in light of the phosphorus, um, you know, because it can help us narrow that list down. You know, phosphate, we tend to think about with it being high kidney function or hemolysis, 
um, can be low with excess parathyroid hormone or some GI diseases. I think about the proteins. You know, albumin, again, we've got to keep in mind things like sample quality. Hemolysis, really the only two things that will put albumin up are dehydration or hemolysis. Um, whereas it can drop because it's not being produced. So things like liver failure or inflammation because albumin's a negative acute phase reactant protein. So its production will drop with chronic inflammation or even fairly acute inflammation. Um, albumin can also be low because it's being lost through the kidneys, through the gut, through leaky blood vessels or with hemorrhage. So it has a fairly defined list of things that can cause it to change. Whereas if we think low globulins, I tend to have a fairly short list for that. Generally, protein, um, a protein losing enteropathy or hemorrhage, whereas high globulins can be polyclonal with chronic inflammation or FIP, or can be monoclonal with um, certain neoplasia like lymphoma or myeloma like that. And we sort of touched on bilirubin before um, with that. With, with the case we're talking about with Lani. Uh, when we look at the liver enzymes, I group them with that. So the ALT and AST are telling us about hepatocellular damage. So these are enzymes that are in the cytosol of the cells. So if you damage the liver cells, they leak out. So they're telling us about that hepatocellular injury. Whereas, and they'll go up pretty acutely. So they'll go up more quickly with an insult to the liver. Um, alkaline phosphatase and GGT are telling us more about cholestasis if we're thinking about the liver. The ALP is an induced enzyme. So whilst the hepatocytes produce bile, they don't like swimming in it. So if there's cholestasis, it induces the production of alkaline phosphatase. So it takes a little bit of time to go up, um, not, not weeks, but you know a, a little bit longer than um, ALT. GGT comes from the biliary epithelium. So it can sometimes be a little bit more sensitive um, with with biliary system disease. Remember in dogs, alkaline phosphatase can also come from a glucocorticoid-induced isoenzyme. Um, and in both dogs and cats, it can come from bone. Osteoblastic activity causes alkphos production. So with bone remodeling, um, it can be higher. So that's why it's high in young animals, because they're growing and turning over bone. Um, we've got to interpret alkaline phosphatase differently in cats and dogs. Um, cats don't have the glucocorticoid-induced isoenzyme. And it's got a much shorter half-life in cats. So, so cats don't have the glucocorticoid-induced isoenzyme. So um, dogs have that and a half-life of about 72 hours for alkphos. So it can be high because of a previous liver insult or steroids. In cats, if the alkaline phosphatase is elevated, it means something is happening right now. It's not a particularly sensitive marker of liver disease, but it's very specific. And keep in mind, the liver enzymes don't tell us anything about function. They're telling us about hepatocellular damage or cholestasis, but not function. We need to do other tests for that. Um, cholesterol, you know, it can be high because of cholestatic disease, can be high because of endocrine diseases like Cushing's or diabetes or, um, you know, hypothyroidism. Um, can be high because of pancreatitis, can be high because the animal's just eaten, um, can be low with liver failure, um, low with um, bad GI disease, um, or it can be um, low with Addison's disease. Always really important to look at those things at the bottom, the hemolysis and lipemia. Um, significant hemolysis will mess with so many chemistry results. So we really need to interpret in light of that. Um, lipemia, um, will cause hemolysis. So especially if you've got samples that are coming to the lab, they're going to be transported overnight. If you're in a regional area, it's ideal to try and let the sample clot, spin it down, take the serum off. If the serum is not on the cells, it can't hemolyze, or use one of the serum separated tubes so the red cells get taken away from the serum. So if we quickly, just to finish up, go back and talk about Lani, who we looked at at the beginning. Her CBC was pretty unspectacular, um, but on her biochemical profile, there were significant changes in her liver enzymes. Um, that's a pretty solid increase in ALT. Sometimes how fast in an old dog, if you know, in an older dog, if it's mildly elevated, it can be a little harder to get excited about. But, you know, 7,000 is not a mild elevation. So we've got signs of a significant hepatopathy in this dog. That can be primary, so from infection or inflammation, something toxic or neoplastic. It could be secondary to GI disease or pancreatitis. 
Yes, theoretically, um, Cushing's or glucocorticoids could put the liver enzymes up, but Cushing's doesn't make them ictric. Um, we understand why the dog is ictric with a bilirubin of 151. Probably not surprising the cholesterol's high with a bilirubin like that. Um, and also not surprising that we had significant bilirubin urine. So it was reasonably comfortable that you know, we either had hepatic or post-hepatic jaundice. So we went to an abdominal ultrasound to look at this dog. Um, I saw this dog when I was working in a specialist clinic in Sydney. Um, it was a Saturday morning special. I am not a specialist ultrasonographer, but functional. So I had a look at this dog. Never seemed structurally okay, um, but the gallbladder was big. And this was, um, if I can find the bile duct, it's large. Um, and so this dog had a distended extrahepatic bile duct. So that is telling us she has post-hepatic disease. So something blocking the bile duct, could be intestinal, could be pancreatitis, you know, could be a stone or something like that. Um, I tried and tried and tried to find this dog's pancreas. She had gas in her gut and stuff, and we just couldn't image her pancreas well. So we did a CPL on her, that was abnormal. Um, so we made a presumptive diagnosis of um, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis can cause um, icterus a couple of ways. You know, pancreatic vein drains into the portal vein. So the liver doesn't really enjoy pancreatitis very much with all that inflammatory stuff and enzymes coming down to it. But also the bile duct runs next to the pancreas. So it can get partially obstructed with that. When um, we repeated her ultrasound a day later, got a better look and she had signs of active pancreatitis. So we managed her with that and over the course of a few days, um, she improved clinically and then over the course of a few weeks, her bilirubin started to normalise. So um, that's it for the main content. So if um, uh, not a lot of you online at the moment, but if you have any questions, um, please feel free to um, ask those. I'm going to say just, you know, quick review there. So we went through some of the indications of the minimum database, looking at the value, but also, you know, looking at the reference intervals and considering in some cases, looking at those results in light of previous results so that individual reference interval can be helpful. The other thing that is always really important is interpreting those results in light of the patient. Sometimes we may find some subtle changes on the on the CBC or the biochemistry, but when we look at what the patient presented for, we may recognise that that's not the reason they presented. So it's interesting, but we need to be finding another cause as to why they presented for their particular um, constellation of clinical signs. So um, if there are any questions, please um, feel free to go ahead and ask those. Well, if there are no questions there, I will say thank you for um, having listened today. And so we'll have the um, next one next week or, or recorded um, where we talk about sort of urine and, and some of the disease specific testing of that. So um, thank you very much for your time in having a listen to the webinar. If you think of any questions afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can get me on email um, or through the call centre and happy to answer any questions for you.